This podcast contains mature subject matter and is intended for entertainment purposes only. Viewer discretion is advised. So I'm beautifully ridiculous and perfect, no less. La da dee da, la da 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 dee da, la 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 dee dee da. Welcome back to the Beautifully Ridiculous podcast. I am your hostess with the most, is Katie Campbell. I am really excited actually for episode number four. Okay, before I get ahead of myself, um, I interviewed Tom January 3rd of 2023. And I'm editing this today, February 15th, episode four, I'm editing February 15th, 2023. And so as I go ahead and edit things and put things together, I'm re experiencing Tom's interview, almost for the first time, again and it's so fascinating to listen to him and I'm just captivated I was captivated in the moment when I was there in person and I'm captivated recaptivated again listening to him and what strikes me especially a man of his demographic being 86 years young what struck me was someone who was very in tune with his own emotions and there's a zeitgeist now of you know toxic masculinity and you know these hardcore feminists what have you I am a feminist I'm I'm not a man hater I think those two things are not synonymous man hating does not equate feminism but there is a general sort of unwritten rule still with on within the patriarchy that men are not emotional beings which is absolute bullshit like I'm I'm listening to Tom and he very clearly is a man who seems to understand and grapple and very very much comprehend that humans as a species are emotional beings full stop gender has nothing to do with it we are emotional beings and it's so fascinating to hear Tom talk about that and to hear Tom as a man, the age that he is, he figured out that people, full stop, are run by their emotions. They just are. And it's bullshit that anybody would claim, oh, it's only women who get emotional. No, it's not. No, it is not. Every human is emotional. You are an emotional being. Emotions are the language of the body and thoughts are the language of the mind. And in order to have some semblance of peace within oneself, you have to have your emotions and your thoughts be congruent. If they are not, if they are not running parallel, if they are somehow perpendicular and crossing wires, you're going to be unhappy um, in anything that you do. And that is totally regardless of age, race, creed, religion, or gender. Emotions are the language of the body and thoughts are the language of the mind. And I just, I am so grateful that I got to meet Tom. Let's hear some more. Yes, absolutely. So there were 400 inmates and there were like four pods at Haney, right? Or four sort of barrack style buildings. Is that correct? Yep. Yeah. Yep. And so how many staff would be there? There was eight units. Eight units? Eight units. And one was like an open dorm type. Okay. Yeah, well, there's two like that. Then one was uh, with uh, cubicles. They had plywood partitions. Mm -hmm. And it went along with a degree until it was a complete cell. The doors closed and opened at certain times and all that. Kind of so there was that kind of variety. And sometimes the inmate could say, look, I don't want to be in an open dorm because he's laying there, you know, three feet away. There's a guy laying there three feet away. On and a lot of guys did like that. They like to be in that thing. They go to bed instead of somebody trying to shiv him or whatever, you know, especially if he was uh, a known informer, uh, 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 an inmate think type thing. Sure. You know, that was, and sometimes 
it was really hard to to protect them. So what we did in some cases, I would make make up a, a dummy file mm -hmm. and uh, put all that stuff down in regards to height, weight, and all the you know, name and everything. And uh, I would send this dummy file with all his information and ship the guy to Prince George because Ocala, the guys were coming in and out all the time, long-term offenders, and, and that was a settling pot, so everybody passed the information. So where, where I was at Haney, but uh, they already knew in Haney how many guys were coming out on Tuesday and who they were, and the paper I got hadn't even come yet, but they all the inmates knew. All the inmates knew? Because people traveling, whether they're going out for medical, one of the things they all had to do is pass on information, and it was worth money, cigarettes. So you say, hey, so-and-so, uh, the name of the inmate up in Unit 8, he's going out to get his teeth done, and uh, he's got so many appointments, so they all funnel things to him to pack out and pack in. So it's their own little networking community of... Uh, the thing what was hard is the staff uh, couldn't, you know, couldn't see it. Couldn't, yeah. Uh, they couldn't see it, you know, so... And it, it was just a business. You're dealing with a bunch of people like George or I, we're each individual. But uh, for me, it was a game. And I was in the game. And uh, the rules, there was no rules. Uh, I could make rules, but the, they wouldn't know. So you had to uh, think like an inmate thought. Mm -hmm. And he always thought about it first, you know, think, but so, and uh, pay people off, pay, pay guards off. Oh, was there some? Absolutely. You hey, some, some dirty guards. Guys doing this all the time. Next thing you know, this, this guy, wife, has got a great big delivered to his house. Great big bouquet of beautiful flowers. Thanks a lot and everything. Her wife says, he comes from home. Well, wow, look at the guy. Oh, well, yeah, I was talking to so and so, and his mother and dad have a flower shop, and or it could be a box of chocolates and all kinds of stuff. But once that's happened, look out, because then it's something else. It'll go from flowers to that, to that, to that. And next thing you know, it's uh, dinner out for two at this restaurant. Right. Owned by some of the family uh, of this kid or whoever. And, uh, and next thing you know, the, the guy's in trouble because uh, he, he's, he he's starting yeah. he's starting to move into well, like a pre-release type program. He's only been there maybe oh. uh, three months and they're looking at minimum uh, like two to four years. And because now you can see, hey, check the staff out. Here's the staff member, right? And if I'll get you out, I'll send you out on visits and everything else. Boom, get him out of there. They've already got his mind, they're controlling him. Yes, yeah. So. Were the guards also responsible for bringing in the contraband and, and bringing in drugs? Could that have been? Yeah. 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 Now, for me, I took it. I, the one thing I never, ever did, I ever said any words ever to my family or wife. When I came home, I stepped out of those electric gates and big high. When I stepped out there to the parking lot, I was Tom Hudson, families waiting at home, and I had the ability to drop that. Very hard sometimes when you uh, see a 17-year-old kid go into the, uh, well, let me think of one that... Uh, Here is where the Beautifully Ridiculous podcast can be an interactive piece of entertainment. As you go along and listen to Tom and the stories that he tells. If you have 
the option or the capability or the wherewithal to digest this or listen to this in a quiet circumstance. Um, pay attention to Tom's voice. And if you can, if you pay attention to his voice, you then start really paying attention to his emotions and how his demeanor changes and how just with audio alone, just listening to him alone, you can see and feel and hear how deeply he was affected um, and how, how much trauma he witnessed with, with witnessing people who had eviscerated themselves with razor wire or um, the murder in the visitation room with the twin brothers who, who were fighting over their mom and one gutted the other. Like, it's incredible to me. I have never witnessed any type of violence like that. And I don't know, I don't know, I just, being in his presence when he spoke of such things, the energy in the room changed. And I can still feel that change in energy just out of his voice. When you listen to this podcast, see how your body responds. How do you feel? Like tap in, tune in. Are you getting goosebumps? Does it make your heart rate go up? Are you breathing funny? Are you holding your breath? Are you, are you hyperventilating? Like, do you get shivers? What, what is happening? Do you, are you responding physiologically to the violence that Tom recounts? Just a fascinating sort of self, um, self, what's the word? self-reflection very hard sometimes when you uh, see a 17 year old kid go into the uh, well let me think of one that uh, going into the uh, Catholic priest's office because the priest had started counseling the guy or whatever and uh, in this one case gave the kid hey here's the key you know they're in a corridor and the, and the kid goes in there slashed them all up bled Slash to death the, the only reason people knew is out from the door came this blood oh tom but it was too late for the kid you know so the kid died or the priest oh, died? He died yeah oh the kid had slashed himself yeah Oh, that's really very... Well, the huge emotion swings. Yes. Kids can be really happy or all kinds of stuff. Or it could be bad news. The girlfriend's given up. Or the wife has moved in with this black guy. And the information is just flying around. So... That was one of my questions, of the dichotomy of being a family man with two children and a wife at home and working with these violent people or propensity for violence and and you've just answered that that you were able to sort of when the gates closed you went home and you were oh you were if family. you don't well it's like life if you don't if that thing doesn't when i look in the mirror it's, hey way to go tom whatever uh, get out and do the best you can if if you don't feel good and that's what like inmates they don't feel good about themselves most of them, and to try and build self-worth, to try to build, when they look at themselves in the mirror, think, geez, you know, uh, you know, the image just has to look, I'm respectable, I'm trustworthy. You know, the kid has to start seeing that in him. And now you're making progress. And it works really, really good. Uh, but the other side is the girlfriend comes in and she's got a boyfriend a great big football player. And this the inmate in there, he's about five foot nothing. And, uh, you know, the, the not a man, this other guy, to, and she's bringing him in to show him off. Now, you know that that guy's going to react emotionally. Yes. He's either trying to escape, Slash his wrist. I don't know what, but you know there better be he something. Will be, he will have so, a reaction, yeah. And if you jump ahead and say, uh, uh, take Harrison and put him in the uh, isolation. And, and we had maximum security and then just bars. And uh, so they take him, put him in there. And, uh, and, uh, and the kid's really mad. 
What the hell made me up and everything else? But you got to give that kid at least 24 to 48 hours to think. Process. To think. Sitting by himself, thinking about his girlfriend, thinking all that stuff. And, uh, oh, yeah, look, wait a minute, I've been here six months. If I keep doing another four to five months, I can be out of here. And uh, maybe, maybe that's a lot better than trying to jump through Constantino wire and yes. ripping your guts a half out. And, oh, have you ever seen anybody that Constantino ever sees? Yeah, it? and it's just razors. It's oh, just a straight razor. If you on see, the... oh, wow. <laughs> I've not seen a person do it, but I can only oh, imagine. It, you know, but desperation. Yes. You know, the guy's on a work gang, and there's a double fence, 12 feet wide. Constantino were on the top, and some of those kids made it through. I that's amazing. They were pretty good uh, because they they knew it, and they would take like a, a work jacket, say like a plaid uh, and put it over. Jacket. Yeah, they they throw. Yeah, they put weights in the pocket. Any rocks or nuts and bolts out of their shop, to, and they would run their sleeves. And they would throw that up, they carry one, throw it up, and it would drop on the wire, and they'd crawl up and they'd roll over it and drop in. Then they'd take the next one and throw it up. For the next, because there was two fences with the yeah. wire on top. And then they'd crawl up the fire and grab their sweater or whatever, and they wouldn't try to pull over, they would roll right over and drop. And somersault down, basically. Yeah. I, I mean, I, what it like. It shows you for all of us uh, the ingenuity of people and if they're, the will's there, yes. they'll figure it out. They will. Yeah, so Absolutely. That for me, that was always a big plus. <laughs> they say, shit, the guy escaped. I said, I know, but, <laughs> but kudos to the kid. Okay, Katie Dids, my friends. My beautifully ridiculous friends, thank you so much for being here and giving me your time. This is episode four, and on my YouTube channel, I already have 13 hours of watch time, and that means a whole bloody lot to me, because that means people are actually giving me the most precious commodity, and that is time. And I'm just so thankful that you all are here. Thank you so much for being here with me. I am just tickled. Um... Yeah, let's get into it. I said, well, last time I went over the BC Penitentiary and we've been over the New Haven Farm and the Borstal system. And now I'm going to teach you about Ocala. How did I get into this? Now, okay, take a step back here. Remember in the very first episode, I told you that I met Tom through my friend George. And the reason why George introduced me to Tom is because I'm writing a book. My father was a lawyer, and he only did criminal for about a year. But the very first legal case he ever got was a major drug bust um, on northern Vancouver Island. And my dad represented a young American woman. And 40 years later, I tracked her down. Um, and I've gotten about eight hours of interview from her, and I'm putting together a book that is, you know, based on true events. She still wants to remain anonymous, which is cool. So I have these eight hours of interviews and I'm writing, I've written 70, 75,000 words out of this novel. Um, it's about a third of the way done, maybe a little bit more than a third, whatever. Moving on, Katie. The point is, I was speaking to her about being locked up in Ocala prison. And when I mentioned that um, she had told me her stories about being locked up in Ocala prison, it was George who said, oh, I know the warden of uh, Haney Correctional who, who spent time um, He's my buddy. He's been my really good friend for 40 years. And I am 40 years old. So I was like, you've known him the entire time I've been alive? That's a weird, that's a weird full circle moment. But okay, George. So anyway, it was her talking about Ocala and a strange little coincidence. There's nothing strange. It's all orchestrated by the divine universe that I love so much. Yeah, that's me and my woo-woo mumbo jumbo bullshit. Too bad for you. You're here. You're stuck with me and my belief system now. You don't have to believe. I do. It's fine. I believe enough for the both of us. Um, but yeah, so that's how all of this came about. And that's how I started interviewing Tom. And now I'm going to regale you with information about Ocala. Hold on to your hats. 
hold on to your hats. So I went over with you the BC Penitentiary, which ran from 1878 to 1980, 102 years. And I also went over with you the New Haven Prison Farm, which ran from 1937 to 2001. And the next thing that I'm going to go over with you is Ocala Prison. Ocala being spelled O-A-K-A-L-L-A. Ocala Prison. The Ocala Prison Farm was a model prison farm on 185 acres or 75 hectares of land next to Deer Lake, Burnaby, British Columbia, Canada. The Ocala Prison Farm opened in 1912 and was initially designed to hold 150 men and women. It was a maximum security prison, opened in 1912 and closed in 1991. The Ocala Prison Farm opened in 1912, and then in 1916, four years later, the women's section officially opened. And in 1942, the women's unit, being a whole separate facility, opened on the grounds. This was renamed to the Lakeside Correctional Center for Women in 1979. But I found that really confusing because anybody who I've spoken to, any woman that I've spoken to who went to Ocala or anybody who I spoke to who went to Ocala or spent time at Ocala, everybody called it Ocala. Nobody that I know ever called it the LMRCC or, you know, Ocala. Like it was just Ocala. So there's that. Um... The original women's unit was expanded in 1953 and consisted of two cottage-style buildings. By the 1950s, the population of Ocala was well over 1,000. As a working farm, the prison had its own dairy, vegetable gardens, and livestock. Executions in British Columbia were primarily carried out in Ocala, with it being the only location after 1919. 44 prisoners were hanged at Ocala between 1919 and 1959. In 1959, the last execution in British Columbia took place at Ocala, with the former sailor Leo Mantha being hanged at age 33. One of the most fascinating things I found out about Ocala was that it was one of the locations where the experiment of performing cosmetic surgery on inmates to remove deformities that made prisoners more likely to offend. The experiment was led by a Dr. Edward Lewison and continued into the mid-1960s. Procedures were conducted on 450 inmates, all voluntarily. Of the population of inmates who voluntarily received surgery, the recidivism rate was 42% against the 72% of the general population. I guess at the time, there was some sort of misguided belief that someone's facial features would have more... um, more predication to be a criminal? It's bizarre. The farming portion of the prison provided work for the inmates and food for the prison. It closed in 1979, and 64 acres of land were transferred back to the city of Burnaby, British Columbia. This land was included in the existing Deer Lake Park that was adjacent to the prison. Following a riot in 1983 and a mass escape in 1987, Ocala was closed down in 1991 and was developed into a new residential housing development and an expansion of the park. Prisoners from Ocala were then moved to various other correctional facilities in British Columbia, consisting of, but not limited to, Vancouver Pretrial Services, Fraser Regional, Alouette Regional Correctional Center, and later the Alouette Correctional Center for Women. I love the internet. I found, I found a really interesting post uh, from a gentleman. I'm not going to give his last name. You, you can find it if you want to. But his name was Barry. And he left a comment on one of these articles. And I'm going to read it for you because it's absolutely brilliant. Barry says, I was a guest of Ocala Prison Farm many, many years ago. I considered myself a B&E artist, break and enter, and paid dearly for it. I saw the really scary side of life for real. Under the cow barn, isolation was the worst. You did not know if it was a day or night, Tuesday or a Friday. It didn't really matter. I was in Westgate A, under 23 years old, so there wasn't a lot of Hollywood movie crap. I saw plenty of attempted suicides, escapes from work gangs, stabbings, usually rats and child molesters, but the worst was probably the human despair and loss of hope. Everyone thought that they were tough, and as soon as they exhibited it, they were shown exactly what tough was all about. The food was nothing short of excellent, and the guards were, for the most part, pretty damned nice guys. 
take my word for it, when I say I could not visualize myself saying that 50 years later. I got parole violated and went back to jail to complete my sentence, which was just over six months. I requested a return to Westgate A, and my wish was granted. Most of the same guys were still there. I firmly believe most of those people were st are still there or have died of drug overdoses. Myself. I took the word correction literally and have never been back, and never intend to. There is no reason for me to ever break the law again. I have a loving wife, a brand new vehicle, a paid-for house, four grown children, and close to a million dollars in the bank with investments. Ocala is just a bad memory from the distant past, but it will always be a stain on my very life. Oh, wow. That's so neat that Barry was able to turn it around and then that he left this comment for us to find. That's so cool. Thanks, Barry. On a website called wikimapia.org, I found this article. The Ocala Prison Farm, a full-service facility which opened on September 2, 1912. The first inmate was William Daly, sentenced on July 31, 1912, to serve a year of hard labor for stealing some fountain pens valued at over $10. By April 30, 1913, some 328 prisoners had passed through the jail's doors. From 1919 until the abolition of the death penalty in 1959, 44 prisoners were executed by hanging on the Ocala site. The first execution was that of 25-year-old Alex Ignace on August 29, 1919. Leo Mantha was the last prisoner executed on April 28, 1959. In 1936, there were several double and even one triple hanging. Thousands of prisoners passed through the doors of Ocala, later renamed the Lower Mainland Regional Correctional Center in 1970. Nobody called it that. It was still called Ocala. It closed June 30, 1991. Originally designed to house a maximum of 484 prisoners, Ocala's population peaked in 1962 and 63 at 1,269 inmates. With population averages of 600 plus, overcrowding was always a problem. In the institution's final years, two nationally spotlighted events occurred. 13 maximum security prisoners escaped on New Year's Day, 1988, following a December 27, 1987 uprising, and on November 22, 1983, a violent and costly riot took place. Rioters caused more than $150,000 in damage in a two-day spree. Ocala was replaced by the Vancouver Pretrial Services Center, the Fraser Regional Correctional Center, and the Surrey Pretrial Services Center. We interrupt your program for the requisite annoying advertisement of my other products, which happen to be music, so... Please enjoy 10 seconds of music. You can find me on anywhere that you stream, Spotify, Amazon Music, Apple Music, YouTube, me, all the things. I've paid for all the things, okay? And now you're captive. So here's 10 seconds of my music, and then please go subscribe to them too. Thank you. Love you. Bye. did find a really interesting article online called The Sunday Historian, Telling Stories of British Columbia's Past. And this particular article was written on December 6, 2020. It is about Ocala Prison. Ocala Prison was a presence in British Columbia from 1912 to 1991. In its 79 years, it gained a reputation for being one of the most notorious correctional facilities in all of Canada. The long, strange, and often troubling history of the infamous jail is colored by stories of executions, escapes, and peculiar activity. The Ocala grounds occupied nearly 200 acres of land above Deer Lake in Burnaby, British Columbia. Constructed between 1912 and 1914, the jail initially served as a prison farm where inmates would serve their sentences by working. Prisoners tended to livestock, vegetable gardens, and learned trades. Such facilities were popular in their time before being phased out by the model of rehabilitation that we see today. Originally intended to house only a few hundred inmates, the prisoner population would eventually swell to over 1,000 men and women. 
The area around the center saw a rise in inhabitants as well. As the whole of the Lower Mainland grew and developed, so too did the community close to Deer Lake. What was once a rather private and open expanse of land became increasingly hemmed in as subdivisions, businesses, and other trappings of society inched their way closer to the jail grounds, something that became a frequent issue of concern for nearby residents. While Ocala housed some relatively minor criminals in its run, it also served as a facility for the worst offenders, guilty of the most serious charges. Additionally, it was a remand center, holding individuals awaiting trials or sentencing, and was even responsible for the confinement of Clifford Olson, whom we've already heard about in episode one. The concern over the nature of some of the inmates and its proximity to the Burnaby community was only compounded by the prison's staggering number of escapes. Over its eight decades, Ocala would see almost 900 prisoner breakouts. Nah, 900! Are we keeping them in or are we just handing them a key to get out? What? Okay. The most scandalous events took place over December 1987 and January 1988. Ooh! A Christmas and New Year's escape. This sounds, this sounds interesting. The former saw three inmates escape through a hole in the prison wall, going on to catch the sky train at a nearby station. <laughs> this light rail. We have a light rail in Vancouver. It's called the sky train. Uh, and they were all dressed in their correctional uniforms. They just walked right out and got on a sky train. <laughs> oh, shit. Okay. While the prison's decision to not alert the public was met with passionate criticism, events only a few weeks later would make this episode seem small in comparison. Oh, great. Okay. Just after midnight on New Year's Day, 1988. Who called it? Who called it? I did. Just after midnight on New Year's Day, 1988, 13 prisoners would escape from Ocala. The group of inmates were being held in a segregation unit underneath an old cow barn and were being overseen by two relatively novice guards. In an almost cinematic sequence, a set of offenders overcame the guards, stole their keys, and continued to release fellow inmates. Two would seize the guards' uniforms and don them as their own, while the others would flee in their prison-issued outfits. Before long, they were out in the community, with one group stealing a vehicle from a couple out celebrating the New Year. This would, in part, lead to the facility's closure in 1991. You think? Hmm. I wonder how many heads rolled at that point. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year, Warden! Ooh. It's said that, to a certain extent, the escapes were a result of Ocala's notoriously poor conditions. Esteemed Vancouver journalist Jack Webster described it as a disgusting underground dungeon, where segregation cells were furnished with only a mattress and a bucket for a toilet. Of course, by nature, a prison is a hardened place, but for British Columbia's largest correctional center, there seemed to be an excess of disturbing events. Over the years, the prison had been tied to incidents of sexual assault, with one former Ocala corrections officer being convicted of sexually abusing inmates throughout his tenure. You'll hear more about all of that nonsense later with Tom's um, continued interview. It was, um, it was eye-opening. In a separate horrifying episode while on a scared straight tour, a teenage boy was sexually assaulted by a group of prisoners. You've got to be fucking kidding me. What kind of incompetency was happening here? Wow. Okay. Such programs were intended to expose young people to the realities of incarceration. Oh, he got exposed, all right. Often by having them visit correctional facilities and interact with offenders who would then scare them off of a wayward path. Hmm. I could, I could, there could be a lot of commentary right now, but that would be unkind. So I'm just going to continue reading. I'm just continuing reading for entertainment purposes only, Katie. Don't, don't get all, don't get all upset. Okay. While an unrelated scare, scared straight program operates presently in the Lower Mainland, taking teens on tours of Vancouver's downtown east side, the Ocala project was not systematic or clearly safe. It said that the jail's house, hosting of youth between 1978 and 1981 was largely disorganized or interpretive, with the attending guard deciding on the nature of the visit. Mm. Pause for dramatic effect. Insert your own audacity here. Okay, great. 
Beyond the criminal events which took place at Ocala, it was also designated as the site for all executions in British Columbia. In total, the prison would see 44 executions take place on its grounds. The gallows, which were originally outside, would eventually be moved indoors and built over an abandoned elevator shaft. Um, okay. Here we go. I was just going to say, when did we abolish the death penalty? But here it is in the next paragraph. Canada would abolish the death penalty in 1976, but the prison would see this province's last execution in 1959. Leo Mantha, a former Navy man turned tugboat operator, would kill his lover, Aaron Jenkins, stabbing him while he slept at Esquimalt Naval Base. Oh, I grew up near Esquimalt Naval Base. Well, not really, kind of, sort of. As the story goes, Jenkins had ended his relationship with Mantha, informing him that he planned to marry his girlfriend. The murder, a near textbook crime of passion, would find Mantha executed by hanging at Ocala. He was only 30 years old. Still, for all of its darker history, the prison was also home to a seemingly well-intended program, even if it was somewhat strange. Throughout the 1950s and 60s, the jail attempted to rehabilitate inmates and better their chances for societal reintegration by performing cosmetic surgeries. Dr. Edward Lewison, a Vancouver-based facial reconstruction plastic surgeon, put hundreds of prisoners under the knife in a bid to improve their self-image and confidence. Most of the surgeries involved repairing broken noses, but other popular procedures included fixing scars, skin conditions, or attending to tattoos, which is hilarious given today's climate of tattoos just being regular body art. Reportedly, the program was quite popular, with many inmates lining up to correct perceived physical flaws. Apparently, Dr. Lewison believed that such things were related to criminality and volunteered his time at Ocala to help those incarcerated. Whether that is true or not, the program, while not well documented and not taken very seriously in modern times, did report some successes. Ocala would close in 1991, not long after the buildings would be demolished and residential housing would take its place. One such neighborhood is the Oaklands, whose most expensive townhouses, whose most expensive townhouses now sell for well over a million dollars. Well, this is 2023, and the article was written three years ago, so I can only assume that those homes are now worth 1.5 million dollars. Okay. A playground exists on the site, and events such as concerts and live shows are held on the grounds of nearby Deer Lake Park. The prison, the inmates, the victims of the crimes which sent them there are memories. In a talk by Earl Anderson, former Ocala guard and author of the book Hard Place to Do Time, the story of Ocala Prison, he likens the history of the infamous jail to the history of corrections in the country in general. And it is true. As with any place or group or event, we can look back and see a mirror held up to the society of the time, to the norms, the notions, the values. And Ocala is no different. Wow. That, wow. That is that is so poignant. I'm going to I'm going to read that again and let that sink in. And it is true as with any place or group or event, we can look back and see a mirror held up to the society of the time, to the norms, the notions, the values. And Ocala is no different. Neither was the BC pen when it closed. I guess that was my point in trying to give some commentary the way George had had um, encouraged me to do is just that, you know, jail and being incarcerated is really just a microcosm of society at large. At the same time, though, and we'll get into it later, um, I did ask questions to Tom about the demographics within the prison system at Haney Correctional Institute. And I was shocked to hear the ratio the statistic on um, indigenous persons being incarcerated the ratio of people of color versus people of versus white people caucasians and i was shocked then and i'm still shocked now at how nobody saw that as a problem nobody saw that as maybe they did I, i don't know i can't speak for anybody else but i was really shocked um There is no gender or race or religion or creed which makes one person more criminal than another. We are humans. We are all created equal. And therefore, our prison populations should reflect that. If our prisons do not reflect 
that, then I think that's a very clear indication to everybody that there is this, some systemic racism and misogyny happening within our culture because our prison population should very accurately reflect the greater population as a whole. And if it doesn't, if it's not congruent with that, um, there, that is because of human bias and for no other reason other than human bias. I love looking up this stuff. It's just so much fun. Here is another article by John Aspiri from the Global News, and it was posted on August 30th, 2018. It says, oh, here's the title. How a bloody riot and massive prison break brought down Ocala, BC's most notorious jail. I thought the BC pen was BC's no most notorious jail, but I guess when it closed, somebody else had to have the notoriety and that just fell on the shoulders of Ocala. Okay, fine. Here is the article. On December 11th, 1987, three inmates at Burnaby's Ocala Prison crawled through a hole in the wall, scaled a fence, ran through the streets of a quiet residential neighborhood to a nearby SkyTrain station, and hopped on a train, still dressed in their prison garb. At the time, officials decided not to inform the public of the escape, a decision that angered local residents and politicians. It also angered at least one of the escaped inmates. Fugitive Heath Thompson, 18, called a local radio station to say he found it strange their daring escape hadn't gotten much attention. I was expecting to see it on the news. Three guys escaped from Ocala, he said. Less than a month later, Ocala became a problem too big to ignore. Thirteen prisoners escaped on New Year's Day in 1988, just days after a riot destroyed a section of the prison. In the 1980s, Ocala was a tense place at the best of times. Built in 1912 as a prison farm, it was designed to reform prisoners and teach job-related skills. Originally surrounded by pasture land, rows of homes popped up around the prison farm as the city of Burnaby grew. Some homes were as close as 50 meters from the fences around Ocala. Over the years, conditions deteriorated. The prison was over capacity, housing a volatile mix of inmates convicted of minor offenses and hardened criminals waiting trial. During its long, strange history, 44 people were executed at Ocala. Others underwent electroshock therapy or even had plastic surgery performed on them against their will. See, I love how there's always contradictory evidence or anecdotal evidence or really just hearsay. Okay, we're humans. We have no idea what's going on most of the time. Uh, back to the article. What does it say? Oh, here it goes. It's just a shithole, one former inmate said following the closure of the prison. Quote, a dumping ground for BC, unquote. According to Burnaby Mayor Derek Corrigan, who worked as a guard there in the 1970s, it was also, quote, probably the easiest prison to escape from in all of North America, end quote. <laughs> there were, are you ready? Hold on to your hats again. There were 890 escapes at Ocala, but it was the... 1988 escape and its messy aftermath that marked the final chapter of BC's most notorious prison. Earl Anderson, who was a 21-year-old Ocala guard at the time, said trouble had been brewing for a few days in December 1987. The holiday season can be a tough time for inmates, a reminder of the loneliness and isolation of prison life. On top of that, most senior staff are away on holidays, leaving less experienced workers to pick up the slack. There was talk of an escape. Anderson recalled, there was talk of riots and you can just feel the tension in the place, end quote. On December 27th, two inmates were caught communicating with each other during a church service. One inmate was escorted out by a guard and a scuffle broke out. Inmates reacted angrily, breaking toilets, sinks, and furniture in their cells and starting a number of small fires, according to the Royal Commission that was ordered following the escape. Things calmed down and guards searched cells while inmates were in the yard. One guard told the inquiry he heard threats from inmates as he went about his rounds the following day. Tonight's the night, the inmate said, according to the inquiry. You're going to see blood. We're going to break this place up. Another search of the cells was ordered. This time, guards found two brass rods, one of which had been sharpened to a point. Inmates accused guards of planting the shanks, makeshift weapons in their, shell, in their cells. At that point, as one officer told the inquiry, everything broke loose. Anderson was standing in a central part of the prison and could hear the sound of smashing porcelain. 
I just remember catching something out of the corner of my eye and I realized what was happening. They had taken a sink and they had thrown it with incredible force against the end gate and it smashed into dozens of pieces, all the shards of the porcelain flying everywhere. And I thought, oh my God, they're going to knock this thing right off the hinges and then they would have control of the whole wing and we'd be in trouble if not dead. Windows were opened, apparently to clear the facility of smoke, leaving the prisoners damp and cold. Amid the chaos, one inmate slashed his own wrists and wrote the words helter-skelter in his own blood on a cell wall, a reference to the convicted killer, Charles Manson. Fifteen inmates who were considered instigators were separated from the general population and transferred to cells located beneath a giant barn. Mm, the hole, isolation, the cow barn. The dank, subterranean cells may have been a perfect way to punish prisoners, but it was less than successful at containing them. Are you serious? Okay. There was some sort of misconception or a belief that because it was like a dungeon, it was very secure. But in reality, it was very, very insecure, Anderson said. The inmates spent a few days stewing inside the subterranean cells, which legendary broadcaster Jack Webster referred to at the time as disgusting, dingy, underground concrete dungeon. It doesn't belong in 1988, he added. It belonged in 1888 or even 1788. The 15 prisoners thrown under the barn had little in way of creature comforts. Guards were told to treat it like any other unit and distributed items like blankets, tobacco, disposable razors, and toothbrushes. The Salvation Army also visited giving out bags of peanuts and candy. It wasn't much, but it was enough for inmate Bruce McKay to hatch a plan. He took a strip of torn bedsheets and tied a sock full of peanuts to the end of it. Ocala Deputy Director Grant Stevens told BCTV, now known as Global News at the time. He slid the sock under a gap at the bottom of the cell door, flipped it onto a door lever, and then popped the door open. Are you kidding me? <laughs> you have to give it to them. Peanuts in a sock under the door, and then somehow you play yo-yo with it, and then you get it on the other hand, other side of the door handle and free yourself? Like, I, my hat's off to him. Shit. The lever usually had a locking pin in it, as an extra form of security, but on this night, for whatever reason, the pin wasn't engaged. Oh, human error. Human error. Okay. McKay walked out of the prison cell and quickly freed fellow inmate Neil White. The pair had a shank consisting of a razor blade that had been melted into a toothbrush handle. They called a guard over, grabbed him, and put the shank to his neck, cutting him and spilling blood. Another guard was told to hand over the keys or they would kill his partner. The guards were made to lie face down and their hands were cuffed behind their backs. The inmates took the keys and unlocked the other cells. Two of the 15 inmates stayed, one because his cell door for some reason wouldn't open. The other simply chose to remain in his cell. As the guards lay on the ground helpless, they heard a prisoner say, let's do the guards. Another chimed in and said, no, leave them alone. You're free now. Anderson said the prisoner who decided not to escape might have saved the guard's life. Quote, the guard really thought he was going to die that night, and he may well have if the other inmate hadn't basically intervened and said, listen, you guys are free, go away. End quote. The inmates threw the guards in a cell and locked the door. Then they made a break for it, a task that was made easier since the wooden doors were kept open to allow heat into the dungeon cells. Two of the inmates put on prison guard uniforms while the others remained in their usual garb. A prowl officer Yeah, a prowl officer was assigned to patrol the grounds, but at the time of the escape, he had been called in to cover someone who was on a break. Wow, it's so interesting um that the universe conspires to assist people when they are determined. I I just Right or wrong, the universe conspires to assist you if you have something you want to do. The inmates who were being held on charges ranging from armed robbery to murder climbed a fence and, as one inmate told the inquiry, went into the night. Kevin Corkery was heading home from a New Year's party at a pub with his wife when three men hauled them out of his car and one got inside. I tried to put up a fight, said Corkery, who held onto the car as the prisoner drove away. I fell off the car. He smashed into another car, and he was gone. Corkery's was one of the several reports to police as the 13 escaped inmates scattered across Metro Vancouver. Some prisoners' freedom was short-lived. Gary DeWurst, DeWurst? DeWurst. 
Gary Dwurst. You know, Gary, that's a shitty name for a prisoner and a guy who was convicted. Oh, you were charged with first degree murder. His name is Gary and his last name is, no, Dewhurst? Dewhurst. I can't read! Dewhurst. Dewurst? Dewhurst. D-E-W-H-I-R-S-T. Dewurst. <laughs> it's Dewhurst! <laughs> you know what? If you're attempted with murder, maybe you are Dewurst. <laughs> So ridiculous, Katie. You can't even read. Oh, shit. Okay, Gary Dewhurst. Now that I got it right. Fuck. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> this is definitely not getting cut. This has to go in. Oh, my God, Katie. Okay, with decorum, find your find your feet. Okay, shit. <laughs> hmm. Gary Dewhurst, charged with first degree murder, was caught on New Year's Day when he went to his parents' home in Chilliwack. Three others, Daniel Fetter, Daniel Gordon Smith, and Alan. Oh shit, Isbister, Isbister, I S B I S T E R. Alan Isbister, were picked up in a bar in New Westminster later that same day. Before his capture, Gary Hickick, oh my word, why? H-I-C-I-K, Hickick, Hickick? Before his capture, Gary Hickick spent time hiding in a Burnaby apartment. According to Canadian press report at the time, he spent his days watching TV news reports about the Ocala escape and chatting up women on the phone. 1987, 1988, there were no cell phones. There was no internet. Google didn't exist. The friend who sheltered Hickok said he hid the fugitive to give him respite from the conditions. It's a scum hole, he said. It's a bad attitude place. All you get in there is a bad attitude. You don't get any rehabilitation. BCTV reporter Alan, no, no, Alan Edwards was at English Bay covering the annual New Year's Day polar bear swim when he was told to switch stories and cover the Ocala escape. He soon received a call from an acquaintance who offered to set up an interview with one of the escapees. Terry Hall said he wanted to expose inhumane conditions at Ocala. Edwards agreed to the meeting on the condition Hall turned himself into authorities afterwards. With his left hand in a cast after punching a prison cell door in frustration, Hall sat at a kitchen table and told his version of events. Some drunk guards were pulling out fire hoses and hosing people down, Hall told Edwards about the riot. The guards were stumbling around, falling against walls. You could smell the booze right on them. You can only push so many people so far. I think this was pushing it right to the limit. The interview did not sit well with BC Attorney General Brian Smith, who blasted BC TV's decision to interview an escaped convict. That a re reputable, responsible news outlet would interview someone who was a fugitive from justice and then allow that person to leave, it could well have been that within a matter of minutes or hours, that person could have committed further crimes, Smith said. Edwards notes, Hall did turn himself in to authorities, as promised, after visiting his family. He believes interviewing Hall was necessary to expose the conditions at Ocala. They were living in deplorable conditions, and that's why they rioted, he said. Prison guards, meanwhile, countered their own accusations of abuse. Edward spoke to a guard who said prisoners spit on us, throw things at us. There have been instances where prisoners have urinated in soup and messed with the food. The morale since I have been there has been really horrible. Over the next few months, all remaining escapees were brought back into custody. The controversy, however, didn't go away. The Commission of Inquiry, which had been ordered by then Premier Bill van der Zalm, recommended the government close the doors of Ocala forever. The sign above the entrance to Ocala featured BC's coat of arms and the provincial motto, Splendor Sine Ocasu, Latin for Splendor Without Diminishment. In reality, the prison's image, due to decades of neglect, had been diminished beyond repair. Corrigan said residents had largely accepted having a prison in their neighborhood, but the New Year's Day escape was the straw that broke the camel's back. It was a place that generated economic activity, but then that corner turned and suddenly it became a deficit, Corrigan said. People were worried about the prison and worried about the fact that it was right in the middle of what was a growing urban community. During the 1986 provincial election campaign, van der Zalm talked about closing the prison. 
On June 30, 1991, the BC government followed through on its promise and the final inmate left. In what is now a familiar story in Metro Vancouver, Ocala was torn down and townhomes were built in its place. Thousands of bricks from the exterior of cell block were repurposed into decorative walkways around the new housing site. The site's notorious past didn't deter potential buyers, who were anxious to own townhomes overlooking Deer Lake. Interested buyers slept in their cars for up to 36 hours to save a spot in line. Corrigan said the area is now a really lovely little community within walking distance of the SkyTrain. The people who live there very seldom seem to sell, he said. That generally means there seems to be a high degree of enjoyment of that particular area. A lot of people were forced to live there who didn't want to, and now there's a lot of people who would like to be able to earn enough money to move in. Wow. <sighs> cool beans. He figured it he out figured and he won. You know, How many? Usually he got caught within uh, 24 hours. Oh, okay, but, you know. yeah. Yeah, because there was so they the first thing they do is run up, break into a house to get something to eat or right. uh, steal a gun or whatever. And know. I'm assuming the corrections would have dogs and whatever and be able to track them down and yeah. Yeah, we had a system of that. We had a blood bloodhound, but they did away with it oh, okay. because uh, uh, the whole thing was the image and. You used to see on the movies, guys down south, you know, they have the bloodhounds going, yeah. the inmates running, all these guys, you know, all that kind of... And so, at first, they had that system, but the best system... Word of mouth? You know, if you work it out, you know what's coming up. And if you don't do that, you, should be, you shouldn't be working there. So you would just go to his buddies and say what was the plan, and yeah, just and yeah, and they would spill. Yeah. 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 Anyhow, I enjoyed it. I mean, it sounds it like was, you did. I wouldn't say a big game, but you have to be. When I left here, my whole thing was that jail. What's gone on today? And the first thing I do, I I talk to my staff. I run this one unit, eight staff. I talk to my staff about things, and they tell me different things. And then I go down, talk to some of the inmates. Hey, what's happening today? How's the job? They're working in the shop, taking auto mic or whatever else, and uh, and uh, oh, nothing. Goddamn instructor doesn't know nothing. I know how to put a motor together and everything else. And a lot of cases, some of these kids are auto mic. They could strip a motor, close their eyes, they put it all back together. With the instructor, he was trained in certain things, and or the body shop and all those things. Some of these guys were quite skilled, you know. And they wanted everybody to know that, you know. Yeah. You know, I could take a V8 and I can get this much more power out of it, but do, do this, all that kind of stuff. So they always shared a lot of things. Don't forget, information, was critical, and people paid with a cigarette for that. Right, currency, yeah. yeah, yeah. And get extra food when you come along with your tray, and there's a shield down so nobody knew who that inmate was. He's coming down, and boom, potatoes, carrots, this, that, meat, he's coming right along. You watch that. All of a sudden, this meat that's coming out for this guy is four pieces of meat. You know, the guy grabs them like that, hands so the staff doesn't see it, puts on the guy's plate. And the staff's watching it. This wow. guy gets triple the rations. Big husky guy's working on needs protein and willing to pay for it and cigarettes of course. Yeah. So Was there anything that kept you up at night? He has kids. Well, <laughs> not really, because uh, you have to uh, be able to turn that thing off. Compartmentalize So when it. I came out of the parking lot and I was driving down there, I, I started thinking of Pat and Brian and Kathy and the you know the other two. So and so that's what you have to do, staff. So when I I talked to. Them, their hands are coming to work. The guy's living in mission. 
and I, I you know, his hands are just ringing, just sweat. And so, a guy was telling me that, there's another staff member, he said, boy, so-and-so has a tap tap. So I was talking to him, and I said, Pete, put your hands out there. He said, I know. He said, there, there's a sweat. He said, I'm so keyed up. By the time I drive my car out of my place, he said, he just couldn't handle the people he couldn't handle. But he needed the job. Right. He had payments to make on his house, and you know, he liked the pension set up and all that kind of stuff. What was so, it about the job that got to him the most? Pardon me? What was it about the job that got to him the most, or do you know? The pressure. There's all a constant prepper. Who's going to escape? Who's into that? Who's giving blowjobs for cigarettes? Mm. You you have to get tuned into that society, and uh, and 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 be reliable. And it just when some of the staff came in, uh, and that gate behind them went bang. They're locked in there for eight hours with them animals. Yeah. Yeah, that would be something yeah. for sure. Thanks for joining us, friends. Tune in next time as we spill more tea with Tom on the Beautifully Ridiculous podcast. I'm Katie Campbell. Enjoy your night.